Um, I am returning to exactly the same form of the Cops and Robbers game that we uh, worked on on Tuesday. I've got too many pages here. This looks like what I really need. Where we have cops. They can be on the beat or in the donut shop. We have robbers. They can be at work. They can be at home. Payoffs. Two and negative five from this cell. One and zero. In this cell, five and zero here. Negative five and five. Okay, just so the main thing that we found on Tuesday was that this is a game that has no Nash equilibrium and pure strategies. No matter what cell we end up in, one of the players will have regrets. Okay. Pure strategy. Nash equilibrium. You guys okay with this game? I saw some people craning their heads. Is it? Oh, thank you. Good, good. Yeah, I, I like seeing all these furrowed brows, and that's, that's a problem, isn't it? This is what the payoff should be. It doesn't make sense for the robber's payoff to be low in the case where they're out robbing people and the cops are in the donut shop. This is the situation that the robbers like. They get to get away with their crime. And indeed, if we can just think for a minute about my mistake, the game I had on the board does have a pure strategy equilibrium, right? Okay, robbers have a dominant strategy in this case. If the payoffs were really this, if we have if our robbers get a conscience and um, decide they really don't like crime, whether they get away from it or not, then they're always going to stay home. And once the robbers play their dominant strategy, the cops will have a dominant strategy to be in the donut shop. So that game I had on the board there was one that did have a Nash equilibrium. It had a dominant strategy equilibrium. So, um, okay. Deep breath. This is the game, right? This is the game we had on Tuesday. This is the game that makes sense for the cops and robbers story. If the cops are on the beat and the robbers are at work, the robbers are the ones that have regrets. They wish they'd stayed home. If the robbers stay home and the cops are on the beat, the cops are the ones that have regrets. They wish they'd gone to the donut shop. No crime happening here. If the cops are in the donut shop and the robbers are home, the robbers have regrets. Ah, we could have gotten some action today. And finally, the point that you raised, if the robbers are out there robbing and the cops are in the donut shop, the cops are going to have regrets because, whoops, there's a lot of crime happening. We're in the donut shop. We don't like that. So, good. Now we're back to where we were on Tuesday. We've got our game that has no pure strategy, Nash equilibrium. On Tuesday, we did find the mixed strategy. Nash equilibrium. And what did we find when we looked for the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium? We found a probability for each player. Okay? A probability distribution over each player's strategies such that given one player's probability distribution, the other player didn't regret theirs and vice versa. So given the probability that the robbers were at work, the cops can't do better than choosing their equilibrium probability. And given the cop's equilibrium probability, the robbers can't do better than getting theirs. Okay, so the way we wrote the mixed strategy Nash equilibria was that we assigned variables to each player's probability. We had P be the probability the cops are on the beat. And we found that to be one half. Okay. And we let Q be the probability the robbers are at work. That was four elevenths. Okay. So one part of our interpretation of the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium here is that this is a game where if you are predictable, you'll be sorry. Okay? 
you will be out of equilibrium, you will have regrets. It's not a self-reinforcing pattern for the players to be predictable. Okay? But in looking for the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, what we also found is not any pro old probability will do. Okay? That there is only one probability for the cops, one probability of the cops being on the beat that would actually make the robbers willing to randomize, choose randomly between their two strategies. Okay? If the cops are on the beat with a probability greater than one half, then the robbers are not going to be willing to choose at random whether they go to work or not. If the cops probability of being on the beat is higher than one half, the robbers would do better by staying home. Okay, so if the cops are not on the beat with probability one half, the random strategies by both players are not in equilibrium. What's different, what I'm emphasizing from Tuesday, is the cops equilibrium probability, having it be exactly the right number, is not going to affect their payoffs. If the cops pick too high a probability, but we leave the robber's probability the same, the cops are doing no better or no worse. Okay? Remember how we found these probabilities. We found them, we found the cops' probability because it was the one that made the robbers indifferent between their peer strategies. Given that the robbers are making the cops indifferent between their peer strategies, the cops, given the robbers' probability, are doing just as well by being on the beat as being in the donut shop. So they're indifferent between being on the beat, being in the donut shop, flipping a coin that is 50-50, flipping a coin that is weighted one way or another. Okay, so the main difference in interpreting mixed strategies is that neither player themselves does worse by picking the wrong probability. Rather, the system won't be in equilibrium. Okay, so there's less of that clear, if I was a player who cared about this game, I would do the mental work to get the probability right. Probably not in this game. Okay, probably not in a mixed strategy case. Okay, so that's recap. What I want to do now is think a little bit about what else we've learned about this game. Okay, and in particular, I want to think about outcomes in this game. So I'm going to put my equilibrium probabilities here. Okay. So with probability one half, the cops are going to be on the beat, and with probability one half, they'll be in the donut shop. Okay. <laughs> Using this definition of P, if I'm on the beat with probability one half, the only other thing I can do is be in the donut shop, so that has to be probability one minus P. With probability Q, now I'm the robbers, I go to work with probability 4 elevenths, and so what's the probability that I stay home? 7 elevenths. Very good. Okay. All right. So in equilibrium, what we're going to see is any one of these possible cells. Okay? Their strategies are chosen at random. Okay, they don't know in advance what their strategy is going to be, but something is indeed going to happen. Okay, with probability four over twenty-two, we're going to end up in this cell. Okay, where the cops randomly decide, oh yeah, okay, today we're going to work. The robbers randomly decide, yep, yeah, we've got a lot of energy today too. We're going to be here, so we're going to see that some fraction of the time. What am I doing to get that number? I am multiplying the probability associated with the cop strategy and the cop probability associated with the Roberts strategy. Now, if you're thinking back to other classes where you've used probability and you're thinking, can she really multiply the probabilities? I can. And the reason why I can is because these random choices are being made independently. Okay? If there was some other factor that was affecting both the cop's choice and the Roberts, choice, if the, these two um, random variables were related, then I wouldn't be able to multiply the probabilities. But in, in the mixed strategy story, the idea is that they are choosing these probabilities independent of each other. 
Okay. The mixed strategy choices are independent and random. Okay. Independent, random, and governed by these particular mixing probabilities. Okay. So this probability here is the probability that the cops are on the beat, I'm writing it out in words just to be very clear, times the probability the robbers are at work. Okay? So when we're trying to figure out the probability that we end up in any particular outcome in a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, what we do is we just multiply the probabilities associated with the two strategies that create that outcome. Okay, so we can do that for all the cells. The probability that the cops are on the beat and the robbers stay home then is 1 half times 7 elevenths, 7 22nd. Same here, 1 half times 7 elevenths. And down here, the probability that the cops are in the donut shop and the robbers are at work, that happens. Probability 4 over 22. Take a deep breath, ask myself, do these probabilities add up to 1? They always have to, right? If you're getting the probabilities right, well, 4 plus 7 is 11, plus 11 is 22. OK, we're fine. We're fine now. OK. So in the mixed strategy equilibrium, we'll see all of these outcomes with some probability. And they're not the same, OK? It's more likely that the robbers stay home than they go to work, but it's also possible that they go to work. Sometimes when the robbers are out there robbing people, sometimes they get away with it, sometimes they don't. Okay. So if you're asked, as you will be in next week's homework, to interpret a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, if you're asked, okay, what's going to happen here? So one thing you can say is that you'll see all these possibilities. You'll see robbers active sometimes, not active other times. You'll see the cops working hard sometimes, not working hard other times. And you'll, you can say something about what's relatively more likely. It's more likely, um, if this is happening over and over again, we'll see more days when there's no crime because the robbers stay home than we'll see days when there is crime because the robbers are at work. So the kind of answer I'm looking for, I'm going to get your question in just a second, the kind of answer I'm looking for when I ask a question, what do you expect will happen, I'm actually looking for the probabilities associated with all these possible cells. Yeah? How do you determine there's no MSNE? There's, there's no PSNE? Or would there always be an MSNE? Okay, this is, um, this is oh, let me go over this. We did this at the end of class on, um, on Tuesday. We can have... There's four possibilities, right? We can have, uh, I'll draw, draw a little diagram I drew then. Uh, this is not a game diagram. This is, I'm just saying, is there a PSNE or no? Is there a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium or no? The game we've got up here, cops and robbers, or possibilities, is a game that has no pure strategy Nash equilibrium, and it does have a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Okay? The way we saw that it, there's no pure strategy Nash equilibrium is we just looked through. There's only four possibilities, right? And so we looked at each cell, and we asked ourselves, um, are either of these cells equilibria in the sense that is there any cell we can be in where one player wouldn't wish they did the opposite? Okay, so in this cell, given that the cops are on the beat, the robbers wish they'd stay home. The robbers have regrets. Given that the robbers stay home, in this cell, the cops have regrets. This payoff is higher. This cell, given that the cops are in the donut shop, the robbers wish they'd gone out and um, done some robbing. And given that the robbers are out there robbing, the cops have regrets if they're in the donut shop. Okay, so it's just... Finding that there's no pure strategy Nash equilibrium is usually just a process of elimination here. Okay. The other things we've looked at were um, 
games that have no mixed strategy, Nash equilibrium, but do have a pure strategy, Nash equilibrium, and we uh, looked at the prisoner's dilemma as an example of that. In a little while, I'll do an example of a game that has both. Um, there are games that will have neither, but we're not going to cover them in this class. Okay. Any game that we can write down this, in this kind of form where we can list all the strategies for each player will have one of these types of equilibria. Okay. Okay. I want to say another thing about, um, it's actually not part of the outline, but it's a, an important point to make, about what everything I mean by saying that the mixed strategy choices have to be random. Okay, um, they can't be predictable in any way. Okay, it cannot be the case that the cops are the easy ones to think about. Since the, co the cops are supposed to be going on the beat with probability one half in order for this pattern of random behavior to be in equilibrium. They can't do something though like be on the beat every other day or be on the beat in the morning of the donut shot in the afternoon. If there's any predictable pattern, the robbers are going to get that. Okay? So the cops have to be truly doing something that cannot be anticipated. Okay? If you think about other contexts that might fit this kind of game, um, income tax auditing is one that, that's a pretty obvious example of that that the IRS would prefer not to have to audit people's income tax returns. It's a big headache. Everybody hates it. It consumes a lot of resources. Um, people, not everybody, not me, not you guys, I'm sure, but there are people out there that prefer to cheat on their taxes than do the right thing. Okay? And that sort of scenario would lead to this kind of mixed strategy, Nash equilibrium. And the IRS goes to great pains to be truly random in the way they audit, um, they choose which returns to audit. Okay? That randomness can be frustrating sometimes. If you're a small business owner of a type that is very unlikely to cheat on your taxes, say for all sorts of reasons, your, your record of doing it, the kind of business you're in is one where your record keeping is pretty transparent. It's really unlikely that they'd get you. They still might audit you anyway because it's very, very important that they are unpredictable. Okay? If they are predictable, then the people who want to cheat on their taxes can figure out a way around their strategy. Okay? The same story could be told from the robber's point of view. Okay? The robbers can't have a pattern for when they're choosing which of their four out of every 11 days they're going to be active. Okay? It has to be something like a coin flip, like a spinner being spun the way I talked about on Tuesday. Okay? So it's not in the outline, but I'm going to put it over here. Um, how do I want to say it? Mixed strategy, this isn't actually the word that people would normally use. That doesn't seem like there is a word people would normally use for this. Mixed strategy implementation must be truly random. No predictable patterns. Okay. Another thing we can say about, and, and, and the subject of interpreting the mixed strategy equilibrium, we could talk about the outcomes. Okay. The outcomes now, we really have to talk about a probability distribution here. If someone asks you what's going to happen in a game where a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium is being 
played, you can't give them a short answer. You have to qualify it, well, this could happen with that probability, et cetera. Okay? It's a little bit easier, not entirely, to talk about payoffs in the mixed strategy Nash equilibria. What you talk about now are, you got it, expected payoffs. Right? Okay. We don't know what's going to happen, but we can, in advance, put an expected value on the equilibrium payoff for both the cops and the robbers in this example. Okay, so let's, um, let's do that on this board here. Okay. As I often do, I use a capital letter U to U for utility to symbolize a payoff. I'm going to say the expected utility of the cops here of, now we're looking at the expected utility from the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Remember, to find Q, the mixing probability, we were looking at the expected utility the cops got from choosing one strategy versus the other, okay, where we only had two possibilities to consider. If we were looking at the cops expected utility of being on the beat, you'll remember that was the argument of the function on Tuesday, then we only had two possibilities to consider. Now we're looking for the expected utility that is associated with the mixed strategy equilibrium, and we have to consider all four possibilities. Okay? That's the only difference. So it's still the payoff from each of the four cases multiplied by the probability we end up in that case. Okay? So from the cop's point of view, with probability 4 over 22, I can be on the beat and the robbers are at work and that gives me a payoff of 2. I kind of like catching those guys. With probability 7, 20 seconds, I can be on the beat and there's no robbers to catch. That's kind of a bummer. Pretty boring. Wish I had a donut. With probability 4, 22 here, Oh, God, I'm in the donut shop. All hell is breaking loose in my precinct. That is a payoff of negative 5 for me. And with probability 7, 20 seconds, I'm enjoying my donut. The robbers are sitting at home. That's my favorite payoff. Okay, so this is the expected payoff of the cops. And um, I won't work through all the mechanics here. When I worked through it in my office, and you guys can verify it, I got an expected utility of 15 elevenths just by crunching through all this. Okay? Same for the robbers. Okay? Expected utility for the robbers of the mixed strategy Nash equilibria. It's the same probabilities, right? Same four cells we can end up in, but now I have to put the robbers payoffs in here because I'm looking at it from the point of view of the robbers. Okay, so 420 seconds times I'm out doing my thing and the cops get me plus 720 seconds times um, cops are out there but I'm at home. My payoff in this cell plus another one of those, probability 720 seconds, I'm at home, the cops are in the donut shop, I don't really care about the cops in this case when I'm at home, and probability 4, 20 seconds, I get my high payoff of 5 here when I'm at work and the cops are in the donut shop. The, that actually ends up being 0. You can actually kind of see how it should be 0 here, that these two payoffs are the same distance from 0, and they occur with the same probability, so it just balances there. Okay. So the expected payoffs here are 
15 elevenths, okay, a number a little over 1, and 0. One place where you might use the expected payoffs of a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium is in thinking about whether the equilibrium payoffs are Pareto optimal or not. Okay? So what do you do if you want to ask that question, okay, or Pareto efficient? Is this Pareto efficient? Okay. Well, let's look at that. Is there some certain outcome that can happen in this game that will make one player better off without making the other one worse off. Let's just go through systematically um, since I can't see the 1511s over there and I'll forget it in two seconds. I'm just going to copy them over here so I can see them. Okay, so does this outcome Pareto dominate the expected um, payoffs from the mixed strategy one? Is one player better off in this outcome and neither player worse off? No, right? You're, you're, you're shaking your head. Who, who's worse off? The robbers are worse off, exactly. Yeah. It's, the hard thing about this is seeing that it's not that hard. Okay? So this does not Pareto dominate it. Okay? What about this cell? Does this Pareto dominate it? No, right? Cops, worse off. This one. <laughs> when I, for what I'm doing right now, for the comparison, no. Okay, what I'm doing, and that, that's a very good question. What Elaine says, am I using the probabilities, I'm mean, elaborating a little bit on your question, at all when I'm comparing the outcomes here with the expected payoffs? Okay, I'm not. Okay? What I'm asking myself is, are the expected payoffs, what we get from these random strategies in the mixed strategy equilibrium, is that outcome Pareto dominated by um, any of these outcomes? Is there something that could happen that would be better off, that would be better for one player and not worse for the other player in this game? Okay? So what I'm doing here is, I am comparing the cops expected payoff to their certain true payoff here. I said, okay, well, that's higher. That looks good. I'm comparing it to the robber's certain payoff. I say, oh, that's lower. So this doesn't Pareto dominate it. Same story here, okay? The cops are worse off here. What do we got here? This is a Pareto improvement, right? Okay? So what can we conclude here? It's an important enough conclusion. I'm switching colors here. This is Pareto dominated by honey. I'll use words here. The arrows are kind of ambiguous, what that would mean. Okay. So the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium is Pareto dominated by cops in donut shop robbers at home. Okay. Now how am I seeing that? Here we are in this kind of this happy world. The robbers are staying home. The cops can relax. The robbers are no worse off here. Okay? Their payoff is no worse than in this risky world. Okay? Uh, the cops are much better off. Okay? The cops are getting a very high payoff here. And that's, I don't want to say that's always a feature of mixed strategy Nash equilibria, but you might imagine that this cops and robbers game, as I indicated with the tax um, example, and you'll get a different example in your homework next week, is a metaphor for a lot of monitoring situations. One player is trying to get away with something that the other player is trying to monitor them for. Okay, those games often have mixed strategy Nash equilibria, and they are often Pareto dominated by one of the outcomes. 
So this game, like The Prisoner's Dilemma, has that kind of bothersome quality, which is that the only Nash equilibrium, the only Nash equilibrium we have is one that's in mixed strategies, and it is Pareto dominated by something that is not in equilibrium. This cell is not in equilibrium because if the cops are in the donut shop, the robbers are going to wish, the robbers are going to have regrets that they weren't out there committing crime. Okay. So that's a worthwhile substantive point, but the other point that I'm making here is just a uh, process point, that when you're asked whether the outcome in a game with a mixed strategy equilibrium is Pareto optimal, what you do is you compare the expected payoffs from the mixed strategy equilibrium, okay, which is going to depend on, it's usually going to associate a positive probability with all four outcomes. Compare that to the certain outcomes in each cell. Okay? And that's what we find here. Okay. No, no. Rose says, can you determine which of the boxes it's going to be in? And that is the key and sometimes the kind of frustrating feature of mixed strategy equilibria. You can't tell, okay? Somebody asks you, smart UCLA grad, this is the situation that's going on in my city. I know these are the payoffs. What's going to happen? And you're going to say anything can happen, okay? That's a feature of these situations where the equilibrium strategy for both players is to be unpredictable. They can't predict each other's choice, and we can't predict their choices with game theory. We can predict what pattern of choices, what probabilities governing the random choices will be a self-reinforcing pattern, but that's all we can do. Okay. That actually reminds me of an, another point I wanted to make, this point about ex post mistakes. We're going to see the same thing that we saw in our analysis of sequential games with nature nodes. Okay. I'm going to use some extra board here. All right. In a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, no player will have ex ante regrets given the other player's choice. Okay. I'm putting this in parentheses because that's just what a Nash equilibrium means. The idea of Nash equilibrium every time in any context has this idea of looking at one player's choice, holding the other player's choice constant, and then flipping the rules. Okay? So given that the robbers are going to work with probability 411s, I, the cops, cannot do any better than being on the beat with probability 1 half. Okay? It turns out I'm not doing any better or worse by being on the beat with probability one half than I would be by being on the beat with probability one quarter or always being on the beat. If the robbers are going to work with probability four elevenths, I'm indifferent between my pure strategies, but I can't do better. Okay, so no player will have ex ante regrets. Okay. The flip side of it is, though, no matter how the random choices, okay, cops' random choice to be on the beat, robbers' random choice to go to work, no matter how those random choices work out, one player will end up with ex post regrets. Okay. 
So given that you're choosing randomly with your mixing strategy, I don't regret the fact, given that you, you robbers out there, are going to work with probability 411s, I wasn't wrong on the cops to flip that fair coin, probability one half, to either be in the donut shop or not. Okay? But we could certainly end up in cells like this one, where I have some regrets, or even this one. Here I'm regretting being in the donut shop when you, you robbers you, you're out there robbing people. And here I regret being on the beat when you're not doing anything. There's nothing for me to catch. Okay? So in this game, there's always going to be ex post regrets the way things work out. But because they're playing the Nash equilibrium, by definition, they're not making an ex ante mistake. Okay? That was the way it was in the sequential games where the mistakes had to do with a choice, choice in scare quotes there, by nature. Here, the, the choice is still by nature. The choice is tru still truly random. Okay? The robbers are picking their strategy randomly, so it's a choice by nature being implemented by the robbers, but there's still this fact about it that if we end up here, okay, so this is a cell where the cops have, I'll do it in a slightly different language, made an ex post mistake here, okay, Crime happened, we were in the donut shop, ah, that's awful. But if the choice to be in the donut shop was made with the 50-50 probability, the cops weren't wrong. They weren't doing something irrational, giving their incentives, they just were unlucky. Okay? Um, over here, look at it from the robber's point of view. Okay? Here's a cell where the robbers have ex post regrets. Okay. I'm just using very slightly different language to make the same point. Okay. If it works out that my spinner, I'm the robbers now, told me to stay home that day, and the cop's spinner randomly told them to go to the donut shop, I'm going to think it was a mistake. Okay, but only an ex post mistake. It's only a mistake after I know the fact of what the cops have done. This is only a mistake after the cops know the fact of what the robbers have done. Before they knew how that was going to work out, they were making their best choice. Or they weren't, weren't making a worse choice. Okay, so there, let me add one qualification over here. This is Usually I switch colors for qualifications. Uh, this is true for any game with a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Okay. This part, that there will always be ex post regrets, this is only true when there is no pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Okay. If we're in a game with both types of equilibria, even when we're playing the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, it's possible that we can end up with ex post regrets or not. And that actually seems like a good place to start talking about or start looking at an example of a game that has both types of equilibria. Yeah? Okay, so Stephanie is asking, is in game theory in general, are ex ante regrets ever possible? Not by strategic players. Okay, that's, that's I would say, a fair answer. Um, in life, people do make ex ante. Uh, mistakes, and even if you think people making ex ante mistakes is a big part of life, game theory can be helpful to identify what those ex ante mistakes are. Okay, but in our games with people playing their Nash equilibrium strategies, there will never be an ex ante mistake. Okay. 
and our, the point I've been emphasizing is that even with these super rational people never making that kind of ex ante mistake, here's a situation where somebody's always going to have made an ex post mistake. Somebody's always going to regret what they did, even if it was the best choice they made with the uh, information they had at the time they made the decision. Okay. Other questions on cops and robbers before I go to the next game? Okay. I'll do my usual thing of erasing from the outside in in case questions develop. Okay. Well, the game I'm going to um, look at next is sort of a coordination game. It's, uh, I guess, a discoordination game. It's the chicken game, and I can't actually remember whether, I, I know I haven't talked about it yet. It's a pretty close relative of Battle of the Sexes. When we get it up, you'll see how it's the same in the small way, and which is different. OK. So the most innocuous version of chicken is um, there's two kids. And in the, oh, there's two kids. And they're riding their bikes toward each other. And whoever swerves first is the chicken. If you swerve first, ha ha, I win. Made you swerve. And I feel great. And you're like, oh, I chickened out. It's a bummer. OK. So um, the choices in the chicken game are swerve, don't swerve. Just as cops and robbers can be a metaphor for all sorts of monitoring situations, battle of the sexes can be a metaphor for lots of coordination decisions, for example, like nominating a primary, using primaries to nominate a presidential candidate. Chicken can be a metaphor for um, crisis bargaining situations, uh, countries uh, rattling their sabers and trying to look as threatening as possible to get some concessions for their neighbors, uh, both of them trying to do the same thing. Okay, so swerve and don't swerve. This is the chicken game. All right, so let's get some payoffs in there. All right, so player A, player B, I don't swerve and you do. Ha ha, you're a chicken. You don't swerve and I do. Ooh. Yeah, I'm a chicken, it's true. Um, a lot of the time what will happen is we'll both swerve, okay? And uh, everybody smirks. <laughs> both swerve there. Let's do it again. Sometimes, though, what's happened is we're both really tough. We don't swerve, and that's real bad. Okay, we crash, we cry. It's bad. Elaine. Isn't the, you're supposed to get one for not swerving. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine points out I've got my negative sign. I'm getting so into my role playing here of acting out payoffs for you guys. I'm not being serious about my my payoffs here. Okay. So in this cell, the one who swerves is the role player they get the negative payoff, the one who does not swerve. Not swerving is what makes you feel good in this game. Okay. Both swerving is bad. Okay, so in the, the way this would be applied in an IR scenario, A and B could be India and Pakistan have in the last decade been playing this game with each other. Um, repeatedly, and every once in a while, everybody gets worried that they get perilously close to this, you know, outcome. Right? Are they really going to start a, a nuclear war in South Asia there? Um, this, uh, doing the somewhat more benign example where probably the worst outcome would be a concussion. All right. So this game does have pure strategy, Nash Equilibria. It's got one right down here, okay. Your player B. Given that I didn't swerve, okay, you're glad that you did. 
Okay. It's embarrassing that I'm calling you a chicken right now. You don't like that, but it would be way, way worse to fall and wreck your bike. I'm player A, okay, given that you swerved, I'm really glad that I didn't, okay? Otherwise, it would have just been one of those boring do-overs. I get to na 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 at you. So neither player has regrets here. And same story up here. You can just completely switch the roles. Given that I swerved, you're glad that you didn't because you'd rather be able to call me a chicken than not. Given that you didn't swerve, I'm glad I did because I'd rather back down and be embarrassed than have us crash. Okay? So this game has two pure strategy Nash equilibria. When I said a minute ago that it's a close relative of Battle of the Sexes, what makes it similar to Battle of the Sexes is that there are two Nash equilibria and one is better for one player, the other is better for the other player. What's different from Battle of the Sexes is Battle of the Sexes, the Nash equilibrium happens when they do the same things. Okay? So you're in equilibrium when you truly coordinate. Chicken, if you want to make a fine distinction, you could say it's a discoordination game. Okay. We're in equilibrium when we do different things. We're not in equilibrium where we do the same thing. Okay. We're either here or we're there. These two cells are not equilibria. Okay. In this cell, given that you swerved, you guys be the role player, I wish that I didn't. It would have been so fun. And given that I swerved, you wish that you didn't. Okay. Here, given that you didn't swerve, I wish I had, given that I didn't swerve, you wish you had. All right. So, I've kind of given away the punchline here, but let's verify whether there is a mixed strategy equilibrium here. And I'm going to just go through the same process that I did on Tuesday. Okay? So, what am I looking for? When I'm looking for a mixed strategy equilibrium, I'm looking for the probability that A swerves and the probability that B swerves. Okay? So let Q equal the probability that A swerves. So now we have to go back to the little recipe that I had in my outline on Tuesday for how to find the equilibrium value of this probability. Okay? It's an equilibrium value if it's the probability that makes B indifferent between swerving and not swerving. One player's equilibrium probability is the probability that makes the other player indifferent between her pure strategies. Okay? So, let's figure that out. The expected utility to B of swerve is Q, the probability that A swerves, times zero. Okay. Q is the probability that A chooses that we're in this row. If I choose swerve in that situation, I'll get a payoff of zero, plus 1 minus Q, the probability that A doesn't swerve, my payoff will be negative 1 there. Okay? So that reduces to Q minus 1. The expected utility to be of not swerving is now I'm comparing my payoffs in this column using the probabilities that A plays these two <coughs> strategies. Okay? So not swerving gives me a payoff of 1 with probability Q. Okay, probability Q, A swerves, I get my payoff of 1. Probability 1 minus Q of negative 10 here. Okay. Making that a little bit neater, I get Q. I get negative 10 here. I get positive 10q. Sounds like 11q, 11q here, right? 11q 
minus 10. Yeah? The bells are ringing. Watch me on this stuff. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these two expressions. What I expect to get from this strategy, what I expect to get from that strategy as a function of, the, of A's mixing probability. And I'm going to find the one, the one probability that A can mix with that will actually make me indifferent between my pure strategies. And again, the reason why I have to be indifferent between my pure strategies is that if this is a higher number, if the expected utility from swerving is higher than the expected utility from not swerving, well, I'm going to swerve. Okay? And if this is higher, I'm going to not. The only way I'm going to be willing to make the choice truly randomly is if what I expect to get from each outcome, each certain outcome, is exactly the same. Okay. All right. So let's find that Q. It's the value for which Q minus 1 equals 11Q minus 10. Okay, we'll bring that around here. We'll get 9 equals 10Q. Q equals 9 tenths. Okay, so there's half of my um, mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Now I want to draw your attention back to what happened when we went through this process with the prisoner's dilemma. Okay? Remember on Tuesday we went through this process with the prisoner's dilemma and we got a probability that was I think negative. Okay? If you get a probability here for a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium that is less than or equal to zero or greater than or equal to one, what that's telling you is that there is no mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. It's telling you there is no reasonable probability that will make your opponent indifferent between their pure strategies. And of course that makes sense in the prisoner's dilemma. When you've got a dominant strategy, there's nothing anyone can do to make that strategy not dominant. It's always going to be better than the other one. Okay? Um, so when you get an unreasonable answer here, yes, it's always good to check your algebra. Um, I bet you guys are better with algebra than I frequently am. Check it anyway. But if you get a negative number here or a number greater than 1, it's not necessarily a mistake. It's just it's a message. It's saying, yeah, this is a game that doesn't have a mixed strategy equilibrium. It's fine. Okay. So that in equilibrium is 9 tenths. Sometimes what people do, I do this, I think it's a, a good practice, is Q by itself, I'm defining that as the probability that A swerves. I'm going to put this little star up here to denote that it's the equilibrium value. Okay? We started off, we said Q is any old Q, any old probability, but in fact, there's only one Q for which this is true. Okay? So we set it up. This thing is true for any old Q. This is true for any old Q. But once we set them equal to each other, now we're saying, now I'm looking for Q star. Q star is the one that will make my expected utility from swerving exactly equal to naught. Okay. So I, when I'm going through this kind of analysis, I find it helpful to keep straight a variable that is truly a variable from the solution that fits a particular question. Okay, so this is the solution that fits the question of what is the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Okay. So in Cops and Robbers, what we did, we found Q, and then we turned around and we found P. We said, um, well, P in this context would be the row players probability. Uh, so I've switched Q and P here from cops and robbers. Remember I said that that's okay. You can use whatever variable you want for either player. Just make sure to um, keep straight which one it is. In this game though, because the strategies and the payoffs are perfectly symmetric, if 9 tenths is the probability of A swerving that makes B indifferent, guess what, 9 tenths is going to be the probability of B swerving that will make A indifferent. Okay? You can work it through, and it might not be a bad idea to um, work it through when you're recopying your notes or something like that, but 
you will indeed find that the probability B swerves is, well, follow my own rule here. Let that be the probability in the mixed strategy equilibrium is indeed 9 tenths. Okay, the reason why I don't need to go through the whole process again for B is if I started to do it, okay, let, let's just say I started to do it here. Um, and I'm actually I'm going to leave that up there and I'm going to do it now for A. Okay, so the expected utility of A of swerving now is going to be a function of B's probability P. Okay, so now I'm A, I'm asking what is my expected payoff if I swerve? Okay, well, it's P, the probability B swerves times zero, plus one minus P, the probability that B doesn't swerve, times minus one. Okay, see, it, it, it's going to be exactly the same. And for not swerving down here, it's going to be P times one plus one minus p times negative 10, and I wish I hadn't erased the um, expected utility of b. I also wish I'd put the expected utility of a here, because that's what it should be. Okay. What I've got here in a in red are a's expected utilities as a function of p, and they look exactly like b's utilities as a function of q. I will go ahead and put b's expected utility back up here of not swerving, it is Q times 1 plus 1 minus Q times negative 10. So if you look at these two pairs, the value of Q that satisfies the blue ones is going to be the same is this. It's never wrong to work it out both ways, and it honestly doesn't take that long either, but it's also fine to look at the game and say that when the strategies and payoffs are completely symmetric, the reasoning is going to be completely symmetric too. Okay? Since we never get any choices in game theory that come from anything other than the payoffs, the equilibrium mixing probabilities have to be the same when the payoffs are the same for similar roles. Okay. Okay. So, what do we think is going to happen in chicken? All right. So, I'm going to swerve with probability nine tenths. You're going to swerve with probability nine tenths. Nine times nine is eighty-one. Eighty-one one hundredths. I'll write it as a percent. Eighty-one percent of the time. It's going to be a do-over, okay? Um, you have to really like chicken to be uh, getting that many kind of dud results, okay? But the thrill of it is in that one-tenth of the time when I don't swerve and you do, and that is 9%, 9 times 1, 10 times 10, I'm just multiplying the probabilities again, 9% of the time, ha ha, you're a chicken. And 9% of the time, also, I'm going to feel humiliated. Oh, not a chicken. And then there's that horrible 1% of the time when, when we crash. I think I'm not going to work it out here, but not a bad problem. Some of you guys are coming to me and um, wishing for more problems. As I did before the midterm, I'll give you more problems to do out of the book. But here's something for you guys to do either over the weekend while you're processing this or later when we re review this for the midterm is, is to evaluate is the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium in chicken, Pareto efficient. Okay. 
I won't tell you now, but um, I'll try to remember to include that in the answer keys that I put up for the final study sheets and um, remind me if I don't. Okay. Right, what else can I say about chicken here? Other thoughts on chicken? Yes. Lilia is asking, I think what you're asking is, do, what do we think is focal in this game? She's saying, what would it be? What are, we've got three equilibria here. We've got two pure strategy Nash equilibria and one mixed strategy Nash equilibria. And I'm going to give an answer somewhat similar to the answer I gave when this question arose with assurance. Can you remember assurance is the game that's Sort of like the prisoner's dilemma, except that when one player cooperates, the other one wants to, too. And I said, in some context, you might think that the fact that the one equilibrium is a prey to efficient by itself would make that equilibrium focal. Sometimes it does, but not always. And I use the hockey helmets example of one, as one where the Pareto inferior um, example was focal, and I think really the reason why people didn't wear those hockey helmets for so long was just because that's how they'd always done it. And one way that things become focal is through the force of history because it's based on our shared expectations. That same kind of reasoning you can apply to these games with both types of equilibria. Sometimes it seems like the mixed strategy equilibria are so weird and so random um, that they shouldn't really be focal, okay? That we should end up at some one, of the one of the pure strategy, Nash equilibrium. Sometimes that is true, okay? Not always. Uh, chicken is not my idea of a particularly good sport, but lots of sports, if you really think of I me mean, like a sport that somebody plays for fun, soccer, football, um, where it's one team against another, those games, if you use game theory, on them will only have mixed strategy Nash equilibria. And if you think about it, it sort of makes sense. What's the fun in watching something where you know it's always going to be this way? Okay? So that would, I think, be an example of uh, games where uh, the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium is focal. And I actually, I think that in chicken, it truly, when chicken literally, the little boys riding their bikes, uh, toward each other, the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium is what they're playing. But otherwise, it's no fun. If one of these is focal because I'm well known to be a maniac and you're a reasonable person, and we both know that we're going to end up here, what's the fun of playing? Okay? Or similarly, if the roles are reversed. In the crisis bargaining situation, if you think about that kind of situation being played between all sorts of neighboring pairs. Most neighboring countries don't get into these crisis, ex escalation, I'm stationing troops on the um, border, you're performing a nuclear test. Most countries don't do this. Okay, so for most countries, you know, either one is dominant or the other one is we're not having these contests. Okay, but occasionally you'll have one where it's not clear and the um, the mixed strategy equilibrium is the focal one. Okay. Good question. The questions on this. Yes. Yes. Stephanie is asking when I'm when I'm asking whether the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium is Pareto efficient. What am I asking for? So let me sort of remind you of that. What I'm asking you to do is to calculate both players' expected payoffs from the mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, where you're going to use the probabilities here to calculate the expected payoffs, but then to take those expected payoffs and compare them to the pairs of payoffs. Okay? So you use the probabilities here to sort of um, revisit a question Elaine asked earlier, you do use those probabilities in calculating the expected payoffs, then you're done with them. Okay, once they're in the expected payoffs, you're comparing the expected payoffs to the certain payoffs that could happen in any of the four cells. Okay. 
Okay. Um, there is one other set of things I want to say about mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. I'm, another set of things I really want to say about cops and robbers. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to save that for, um, for Tuesday. Okay. So do your homework. If you didn't get the homework on Tuesday, it's up on the website. And um, we'll see you next week. Oh, yeah.